Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, I have a little bit fancier slides today. So, uh, well, for part of the presentation anyway. We'll go back to the Beamer slides later. But for this, we needed some highlighting and stuff that I don't know how to do in Beamer. So, all right. So we've been talking about functors. So we have FMAP. Hmm? I thought somebody said Julie. So I'm just hallucinating, apparently. All right. So we've talked about FMAP, right, which lifts an A to Z function into an FA to FZ function. Oh, wait. I'm supposed to be using this today. I don't know how to use it. There we go. Oh, no, I don't have the little thing in, do I? I guess I wasn't really ready. I'm sorry. So just stare at FMAP for, <laughs> for a moment. Try to meditate. Yes, try to absorb the lessons of FMAP. Wow, the magnet is strong. The, the little nub thing is, in the, is kept in there with the magnet, and it's really strong. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, let's see if it works now. Oh, wrong way. Okay. Oh, look at that. All right. <laughs> so FMAP lifts, right? A functor is a type to type or a kind star to star type constructor function, yes. And we lift a G A to Z function into this F A to F Z, right? And this is why it's called lifting, because in the mathematical diagram, we lift, right? We raise it to the top. All right. So this is what the, um, the, the class uh, de declaration looks like. And so this is our regular functor class de declaration. We're all quite familiar with it by now. But this is, as I said, these are covariant functors. So in covariant functor, the arrows are all pointing in the same direction, right? We have an A to Z function and an F A to F Z function. The, a, the arrows between the A and the Z are all pointing in the same direction. So that's a covariant functor. And we talked yesterday about how some things are um, covariant in, I think we did, the end of, not yesterday, the day before. We talked about how um, some things are contravariant in some articles, so in some arguments. So we're going to look at the contravariant class now. So this is another type class. It is a type class of functors, but they have arrows going in the opposite direction. You see that we have an A to Z function that gives us an FZ to FA function. So this is a contravariant functor with the arrows reversed, right? Covariant goes, wait, I'm going backwards here. OK, so covariant goes this way, where all the arrows are point from A to Z are pointing in the same direction. And contravariant goes the opposite way. So when you first see this type signature, for a lot of us at least, it's quite, uh, quite mind-bending. Right? The first time I saw it, I thought, that can't possibly work. How can you possibly do this? Right? Go home, Haskell. You're drunk. So, but no, it does work. And that's what we're going to talk about first. I keep getting the arrows wrong. See, I'm contravariant. I have my arrows backwards. All right. So this would be the lifting diagram for contramap. Right? We still have a type to type type constructor, so F is still two stars, right? kind to kind. G is still an A to Z function there on the bottom. Right? A to Z goes in the way we expect the function arrow to go. But when we lift it into the F, we're lifting it to be an FZ to FA. So contramap G is FZ to FA. So we're going to talk about what those Fs could be that could make that, could make that real. <clears throat> so when I first started learning about contravariant, I did what everybody does when they're trying to learn some kind of difficult math, and I looked it up on Wikipedia. And Wikipedia said, contravariant functors reverse the direction of composition. Ah. Now, function composition is something we're quite familiar with, right? 
oh, that happened really fast. OK, we talked yesterday about how the functor instance, the regular functor instance with functions, is the same thing as function composition. Right? So, or not yesterday, the day before, whatever. So we started off with, right, if we had, look, oh, look at that. All right, so if we had, right, our function arrow A, so the function arrow applied to its first argument was our F in F map, right? If we, if we turn that around so that the arrow is not in prefix notation anymore, then the type signature looks just like function composition. And so we know that those are the same, right? Let me point over here for you guys. See how when we turn that around, then it looks just the same. Does everybody remember this? Everybody feels quite comfortable with this? OK, so the covariant functor for functions is function composition. And Wikipedia has just told us, right? So we can write our, our, our functor instance just with using the dot. Oh, and here's another, another diagram. So this time we have the, we've gone ahead and turned the Fs, right? We've made them specific so that we see that the F is A to something. And so we see how when we lift the Z0 to Z1 function into that context, we get an A to z0 and an a to z1 function, right? All right, so Wikipedia has told us we now know what function composition has to do with functors, right? That's the covariant functor functions. So Wikipedia has told us that contravariant functors reverse the direction of composition. So what we need to do is write a reversed function composition, which seems pretty easy, right? See, that happens fast, too. I thought it was supposed to happen when, we, when, we, when I clicked. All right, so we would have then the two type signatures are up on the top, right? The dot goes B to C to A to B to A to C. A reversed function composition then would go from A to B to B to C to A to C. And all we would do to write those is just reverse the actual order of application of the, of the functions, right? And then we have a reversed function composition. All right. So, Can you put that yes. So with the with function composition, in the normal way, if we have two functions f and g, and an x, then we first apply g to x, and then we apply f to the output of g of x. With reversed, <laughs> right? If we still give it the okay, if we if we give it an f and a g and an x again, then we we've got to reverse this, right? To get to our a to c function at the end here, we have to reverse this order. So we'll apply the f, the first function, because that's what takes the a. Right. In both cases, the last argument here, right, is an A to C function. Now, of course, A would be one of the inputs, right? A here is equivalent to this X, right? So A is this X. So, of course, with reversed function composition, we can't apply G to that A, right? G doesn't take an A. So we have to apply the F first and get the B. And then the B can get handed off to the G function. And then we return our C, and that's the end. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have questions? All right. So X is A. See, I can only laser point on one side. I need two of them. All right. All right, any questions about this? Suddenly it's so quiet in here. <laughs> OK, next. So function composition is a function that allows us to change the output of something, right? So when we, if we go back and look here, right? Oops. 
with function composition, we have an A to B function. And we want something that allows us to change it into an A to C function. Right? And so that's what our B to C function does for us. It takes us from this B, that's the output of that function, to a C. All right. So yes, here I have it rewritten with Zs. I like the Zs better sometimes, but I don't know. I don't know if it helps. All right, so we have the a to z0 function, and we want to get to an a to z1. And so we get the z0 to z1 function. Very nice. All right. So uh, oh, this slide wasn't supposed to stay in there. That's just my notes. OK, so the covariant functors give us a way to, take, to make an fa to fb function from an a to b. So it gives us a way to, to change the outputs of something. The contravariant functors are going to do the opposite. Reverse composition is going to give us a way to change the inputs. So here we're going to have, we, we have an, the z is still the output of both of these. And we need a way to change these inputs from a0, which would be the x, right, of, f, of g of f of x. That a0 would be the x. And so we need a way to be able to change that a0 into an a1. And so what we do is add a function that does that. They just get applied in a sort of backwards order, right? Or backwards from what we're used to. So these are functions that give us a way to change the inputs. All right, so if we write our reversed function composition, we're all used to seeing this, right? This would normally be written with a dot, of course, right? If we composed right, equals to 10 with length and applied it to a list, we're, we're quite used to seeing it in that order. All this does is just change the order in which you have to give the arguments if you want it to do the same thing. Does that make sense? OK. So here's our class definition again, right? class contravariant f, where and the f is still for functor where contramap has the type a to z to f of z to f of a. Yes. All right. So if we compare f map to contramap, because they are quite similar, we can see that in f map, the f's right, are a to something. We're talking about the, if it's function composition, right? With contramap, the f's now are the results of functions. So when we talk about, in contramap, when we talk about these f's right here, they are this, the function arrow and its result. Does that make sense? All right. OK, so we can write a contravariant instance like this, right, where the functor instance is equivalent to where the f map is equivalent to function composition. This contramap would be equivalent to flipped function com composition, right? just backwards function composition. Now, this doesn't actually compile like this. This isn't a way that we can actually write this instance. We have to do something else to be able to. You can partially apply the function arrow to its first argument, like we did in the functor instance. And that's OK, but you can't do that with the second argument. And so we have to do something else, which we'll talk about in just a minute. All right, so when we now when we're lifting, we're lifting into here's our f, right? An a would be out here, right? the a to z. And so we're now lifting into a context where this a0 becomes the input to an a0 to z function. And the a1 becomes an input to the a1 to z function. Right. And so by composing these in this order, we, have, we take an a0 to a1 function and an a1 to z, and we're able to get an a0 to z function. OK. Cool. So I'm always. Um, I always hate it when mathematicians say that something is intuitive. Um, I think math people and thus Haskell people tend to overuse that word. A lot of things that they think are 
intuitive or they call intuitive where I think really they mean informal um, are not really intuitive at all to me but I think that these diagrams these ones are fairly intuitive right like intuitively we can we can say that if we have a route from A to Z0 and a route from Z to Z1 sure we can compose those and get a route from A to Z1 right and similarly if we have a route from A0 to A1 and from A1 to Z, then sure, we can compose those and get this route from A0 to Z, right? So, good job, mathematicians. All right, so again, this doesn't actually compile, but we're, gonna, we're getting there to where we can make it compile. What we need are some type wrappers. So, these are some contravariant functors. So, we have this new type wrapper, OpZA which is just a wrapper op around an a to z function. So this is sort of the most generic of all the profunctors. Uh, sorry, contra, contravariant functors. It's not a profunctor. We're not there yet. <clears throat> so it's sort of the most generic because it's a wrapper around just any a to z function. Right? It takes one, or it takes, uh, sorry, two, two arguments here, right? z and a, and then it reverses them over here. Predicate, equivalence, and comparison are wrappers around more specialized types of functions, right? So predicate A here has, is an A to bool function. Equivalence is an A to A to bool. So it's the double equal sign, generally speaking, right? And comparison is an A to A to ordering, right, for orderable things. Okay, so these are some contravariant functors, and uh, we can see that they're all s wrappers around functions, right? Functions are the prototypical contravariant functors. We just have to have wrappers around them to make our contravariant instances, um, no, I mean, to make them compile, but there are reasons why we need them to make them compile, right? So, we, for right here, what we need instead of this, what we need instead of that, is one of those wrappers. Okay, so the op z, right, remember that um, contravariant, like the functor class, needs it to only have one parameter, right? It's only, it's only of kind star to star, so it has to have one parameter. So we see that predicate, for example, has an A, equivalence has an A, even though it gets used twice in the function, it's the same A, so it only actually has one parameter. And comparison also, same thing as equivalence. But this op has two of them, right? It's an op ZA, which means it's actually of kind, how many stars? Three stars, right? It needs to be applied to two arguments. So what do we do to write that instance? apply it to the first one, right? We'll be partially applying it like we did with either and um, function and some of the other types that we've looked at. Okay, so <coughs> with these new type wrappers, um, I, I, how many of you are familiar with this, this nonsense here? In general or off specifically? In general, In general. this syntax. Does everyone feel okay with this syntax? I don't feel okay with this syntax personally, but is that is everyone okay with that syntax? Okay. So this get op. Huh? What's wrong with it? Um, nothing's wrong. Dislikable about it. Nothing's wrong with it exactly. It just is. Um, I don't know. I just find it sort of confusing and to read. So it is for me. I think maybe I just haven't really quite gotten used to it. I tend not to write my new types like this. I tend to forget that this, that this exists. And so I would just write like op and then, you know, in parentheses sort of A to Z. And, but that makes it harder later on when you need to unwrap this thing to call the function. So this makes it easier. I'm pretty sure this makes it a lot easier if you just, if you just do them like that. I just sort of find them hard to read, and so I forget to use them. 
it is just one of my one of my weaknesses as a Haskeller, I guess. All right, so we have now an instance of contravariant for op partially applied, where the contra map of f and g is going to equal op get op. There's our little a to z function, right? G composed with f. It's that flipped function composition that we were just talking about. So that's what our instance will look like. So let's look at an example. All right, so if we have this is 10, that has the type op bool int. Right? Do we see why the, the parameters go in that order? Because this is going to flip it into an int to bool function. Right? Do I have that written down? Yes, I do have that written down. All right, so yeah, this will be op bool int will be op around an int to bool function. So we have, I like this laser pointer. So we have this equals to 10, right? And here we have is list of 10, which is an op bool and a list of x, which will flip into a list of x to a bool. This is an extremely trivial example. I understand that. Stick with me because they're going to get much harder. So we will then contra map length. Length is just the regular prelude function length, right? Which that takes the length of a list. And is 10. So it will, which one of these will happen first? Length, right? And then is 10 when we apply it to a list. OK, so we have here contramap length is 10. Let's look at the types here. Our a0 to a1 function is length. That's our list of x to an int. The f a1 is our is 10, which has the type op bool int, op bool being the f, and int being the a1. And our f of a0 is is list of 10, which is, again, the f is op bool, because those f's need to be the same, right? List of x. So we know we're going to start from the a0 <coughs> when we apply. So we would, we would call our little get op function with is list of 10 on a list, because we need a list of x as our first input. That's our x. That's our A0 that starts the whole chain reaction, right? And that's false, of course, because it's not equal to 10. But this one is. It seems like a lot of machinery to accomplish that. I understand that. We're, we're, we're getting to more interesting examples. OK, so what we just did with um, the equal t being equal to 10, that's perhaps better represented by the new type predicate, which is a to bool, right? And so it already has that bool you know, absorbed into the predicate type. So we don't have to keep ex being explicit about that. So being equal to 10 is a predicate. And so we can use this. It's not that exciting to refactor it to use predicate instead of op, but we'll look at the example. So our, our contravariant instance now will be predicate, get predicate, G composed with F. And we'll rewrite it like this. So now the bool is gone. We had op bool int before. Now we just have predicate int, because the bool is already part of that. And is list of 10 is now just a predicate list of x. The contra map looks the same. And it works the same. All right. Any questions about that before we move on to? A new example. OK, because now we have a completely new example. All right, so now let's look at the new type equivalence. This is another contravariant functor. We have two a's. Well, we have one type parameter a right, right there. But when we unwrap the function, then we have a to a to bool. All right, so the contravariant instance for this looks like this. We have the f and g functions here. We're going to have to pass an x and a y into here to get f, to get this f function here to apply to x and also to y. And then we apply g to the result of both of those. All 
All right, so there is a default equivalence um, that is just equal to the, the equal sign. You can come up with other um, you know, equivalences um, if you want to or need to. What we're going to do here is um, if you want to compare tuples on only their first value, right, the default equivalence for tuples compares them on both values. Right, so that a tuple of 1 and 3 is not equal to a tuple of 1 and 2. But maybe there are times when you only want to compare tuples on one or the other side. Right, so that's what we're going to look at here. So we're going to contramap first. Is everyone familiar with the fst, fst function? Right, that takes the first element of a tuple. Right, okay, so we are going to contramap fst over def and default equivalence. Those are going to be our two functions, de default equivalence being equal to equals. All right, so here our a0 to a1 function will be fst, which will take an a and a b and return an a. Default equivalence is equivalence a, so our f is equivalence. <laughs> and our first equivalence is equivalence a, b, so it's going to take the F is still equivalence, but the A, B tuple, it's going to first apply first and take the A's out, then compare them for equality. Everybody with me? All right. Awesome. So we can see that if we compare two tuples with just default equivalence, those two tuples are not equal, right? Because this is just default equivalence. And so we would default to the normal tuple equivalence. And since the 2 and 3 are not equal, we would get false. But if we use first equivalence, now they're equal. Because their first elements are equal. Everybody with me? You all are so with me. This is great. All right. <coughs> so fmap from the functor class acts on outputs. Right? It takes an fa to an fb. So it acts on the outputs of those. Contramap acts on the inputs. So it seems a little bit backwards, but really it's just flipped function composition. So understanding contravariance is going to help us understand profunctors. All right. We looked at bifunctor uh, the day before yesterday. Let's just quickly review it because profunctors are bifunctors. All right. So. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on bifunctor because it's sort of just two f maps, right? So we're acting on two outputs now, and um, that's really all. So we saw the the we saw how bimap works for either and for tuples, right? On that one, we would actually apply one of those functions because we don't have a left and a right at the same time at the term level, and here we would apply both of them. All right, and so we looked at this function that, you know, we'll, we'll bi map both of these greetings over either an either, right, where it does one at a time, or both of them. Okay. So, profunctors are bifunctors. They're bifunctors that are contravariant in their first arguments and covariant in their second arguments. Okay, so in the second argument, it acts just like a bifunctor. In the first argument, it acts just like contravariant. <coughs> okay, and that's why pro profunctors are sort of weird and, and, and hard. So if we compare these, right, the, the main, oops, what? There we go. All right, so if we compare these, the main method of bifunctor is called bimap. And of profunctor, it's called die map. And by and die are both prefixes that mean two. Right? So, OK, so let's look now at the class definitions for both of these. So bifunctor has the f of the type or kind star to star to star, right? Because it needs two parameters. It's covariant in both of, these, of them because it's a bifunctor. Profunctor is the same right? because it's a bifunctor, too. Right, star to star to star. So we know we're going to need things where most of our contravariant functors just had one argument, right? Like equivalence A. Now we're going to need things that have two. All right, and 
um, here, right? This is the difference between bifunctor and profunctor right here. The first argument of, bi of bimap is an A to B function, and the first argument of dimap is a B to A function. So this B and this A. This A and this B, right? That's why I made the fancier slides for this one, so that we could have this highlighting, because I don't know how to do this with, with Pandoc. <clears throat> I'm not sure you can do it with Pandoc. So this is the class definition for profunctor. We'll, we'll mostly be talking about dimap. The, the profunctor class does have some other um, methods. So there's a right map and a left map. Um, but we're going to focus on dimapping. Huh? Uh, because it's contrabalanced. What? Uh, we have flipped both the top and the bottom leg. We should flip only one of those. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, it's identical, right? Yeah, you're right. I flipped too many things, didn't I? Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, this should be FAC and FBD, just like up here. And then the, just that's flipped. Oh dear. You can't make a whole deck of profunctor slides if I can one error backwards. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's probably true, but still, I feel bad. OK. So here, I think here I got them the right way, though, when I put them as A1 and A0, right? A1, A0, A0 to A1, right? Now it's the right way. Yes, OK. So the zeros and ones maybe help me. I don't know if they help you, but I think they help me. OK. So now we have the a0 to a1 function, a z0 to z1 function. But we're going to get the a1 here and the a0 here. Right. All right. So dimap then is g f g h. So three functions, or well, one function, f g and then this is the H, right? And we compose them in this order. So we apply F first, and then the H, and then the G. Let's look at why. Hopefully these are all still in the right order. OK, because the first thing that we're going to pass in, just like when we were doing the you know, the, the length in the is 10, right? The length has to apply to the list first, which then turns that into an int that we can then compare, like, equals to 10, right? So the first thing that we're going to pass, the first value that's going to go into this chain of, of reactions here is this a0. And so first we have to change the a0 into an a1. Then we're going to have to come down here and change the a1 into a z0. Then we have to go up here. And there's a z0, and we have to change it to a z1 so that we can get our final result. And thus, the strange order of composition here. All right, so bifunctors lift twice, like two f maps. We take it, right, we get an fa to fc function and an fb to fd. Profunctors lift twice too, just one time is backwards. So dimap kind of gives us a contramap and an f map. Instead of bifunctors, two f maps, we sort of get a contramap and an f map. The contramap gets us from a1 to a0, and the f map gets us from z0 to z1. Right. So this here is the contravariance, the contravariance uh, argument, I guess you would say. I don't think that's te the technically accurate to way to say that. But and this one is the covariant one. So we say that, bi that profunctors are contravariant in their first argument and covariant in their second one. All right. And if we Did sort of, huh? Like that, no? Oh, we're going to look at some examples soon. Uh, yeah, but like how you say it's contravariant in the first one and covariant in the second one. Mm -hmm. Is that sometimes reversible? Like no. Like you have a diagonal dynamic between something like being co in the first one, contrary in no. the second. So we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that. 
Profunctors are always going to be contravariant in the first argument and covariant in the second one because of the nature of functions, because of inputs and outputs going from, yeah. For that to make sense, you have like reverse functions, right? You, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So since we're contra mapping first, right, because it's contravariant in the first argument, and contra map is G composed with F, right, the F gets applied first. Then when we're going to, you know, go apply G, G is composed with H in this order. And so we go from F to G composed with H, and so it turns out in this order, roughly speaking. Okay, we're going to start looking at examples now. All right, so we've just given some strings new names so that it's a little bit easier to follow the, wait. I thought phrase was a list of strings. No, it is a string. It's just a string with spaces in it. Okay, so see how confusing it is dealing with strings. All right, so we have a word which is a string that is just one word, and a phrase, which is a string composed of several words. So there's spaces in it. Okay. We're going to have this function that capitalizes words. So it only works on a word, so it only works when the string is just one word, <laughs> and there's no spaces in it, right? But it will capitalize the first letter, and then make sure all the rest of it's lowercase. That's our, our cap word function. Now our cap phrase function is going to use the combination of words and unwords. This is our F and our G and our H. Right? It's going to use the combination of words and unwords to take this, this if, if we have a phrase, so we have a string that has spaces in it, Words will take those spaces out and give us a list of strings. Do we have annotations? I think we do. Okay, yeah. So words will take the spaces out and give us a list of strings. And then we'll capitalize, right? Each, then we'll use cap words, fmap cap words, to capitalize the first letter of each one of those strings. Then we'll use unwords to turn it back into a phrase, to put spaces back in it. Okay, so our F, our A1 to A0, is words that goes from phrase to a list of word. Our G, Z0 to Z1, goes from a list of words to a phrase. So we've gone forwards and backwards, right? Words to unwords. These are not, in case you were curious, these are not isomorphic because we will lose spaces if there are extra spaces in the phrase. I don't know if anybody was curious about that. I was. So, um, but we'll go from a phrase to a list of word and then back to a phrase with the composition of these two functions, right? But in the middle, we want to do something to that. We want to do something to that list of words. And what we want to do to that list of words is go from a list of word to list of word because it's got to be the output of one function to the input of the next one, right? So it's got to have the same, right? List of word to list of word has to be the output of this function to the input of this function. It's like a, it's like a bridge between these two functions. And then in the end, right, our whole thing has the type phrase to phrase because this A1 <laughs> is a phrase that we will pass two words to turn it into a list of words, which will get passed to fmap cap word to become another list of words, just capitalized this time. And then it'll get passed to here and come out the other end as a phrase. Right. So this is the sort of general intuition for what profunctors are for. When you've got some stuff that you want to you wanna sort of take into a chain of a chain of functions that will possibly transform it to a different type and do some stuff that it can only do to something of that type, not its original type, and then kick it back out in its original type. 
It doesn't always come out the other end in its original type. It can change at the end. But <coughs> that's the sort of general intuition for what profunctors do. All right, so if we use cap phrase, which is you know, die mapping words on words and F, F map cap word over a phrase, such as Julie loves donuts, you can see that we came out with each of the first letters capitalized. almost as if by magic, right? All right, questions about what we've done so far? No. <coughs> I'm still a little bit at loss of why you would use it. Why you wouldn't just put a dot and then re you know, reorder it and <laughs> be done with it? Um, that's a good question. We're kind of going to address why we have profunctors at the end. And I'm also going to address the fact, but maybe I should just reassure everybody right now. Um, you don't have to use profunctors to be, you know, to like write real Haskell. I mean, lots of people write real Haskell and have never touched the profunctor class. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So there are reasons, and we'll talk about them more at the end of the talk, why it can be helpful to sort of develop some intuition for, for what profunctors are and what they do. Um, but I mean, even, even some people who are writing things with profunctors, um, so for example, a library that I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end called Fold, I think it's called Fold L that Gabriel Gonzalez wrote. What he has there, his data type that he's working with there, the fold type, is a profunctor, but he doesn't want to depend on profunctors, so um, he doesn't. So it is a profunctor, but it has nothing to do with the profunctor class. So there are reasons why it can be helpful to develop a sort of intuition for what profunctors are doing. And they have something to do with um, the way streaming libraries are written as well, although they don't use the profunctor class either. But um, this is not something like, like you have to understand and use in order to be like a real Haskeller. Yes? Are strings profunctors? Yes, some of them. Yeah. Yes, because a stream sort of intuitively is taking some inputs and changing them so that it can do some stuff to them and then st streaming them back out the other end, right? That's why they're called pipes and conduits, right? Because, I mean, the two biggest libraries for streaming in, in Haskell, right, are called pipes and conduits because that's sort of the intuition, right? You've got this sort of pipe and water comes in one end and some stuff maybe happens to it in the middle, right? And I think in normal plumbing, nothing happens to the water in the middle. But in, <laughs> in our pipe, something can happen to them in the middle, right? Um, and then it's gonna, sort of going to go out the other end. Or it can go out the other end, because it, then it could be an input to something else at the other side. That's sort of the intuition for profunctors. We take, we take in a phrase. We kick out a phrase. In the middle, something happened to it, right? <laughs> I have no idea, actually. They didn't used to be called profunctors. They used to be called, in category theory, they were called distributors, I think, something like that. And I don't know what that word means either. And perhaps one of the category theory people here can, can talk about that. I have no idea. I don't know a lot about FRP, but it wouldn't surprise me. So, because it's the same kind of thing, right? Where you're taking in some data and then you need to change it in some way and kick some more data out the other end, right? And so that wouldn't surprise me. And that's the general intuition for what profunctors are and do. Um, and so I find them interesting. And Gabriel's fold L library is really, really cool and, and good. Um, and that data type is a profunctor. So he uses profunctors to do list folding, to do really efficient list folding, basically. So um, anyway, we'll talk about that stuff more at the end. All right. So what have we done here? Oh, right, we've broken this out into functions, right? Because this, I found that this, um, because I do play with sort of string processing a lot, 
um, because I'm a linguist and I like to do stuff with texts. Um, I have found that just breaking out this partially applying die map just to words and unwords is by itself sort of a useful function for me. Um, you could, of course, write that without die map, but um, now that I can use die map, right, I, I need to show off. <laughs> so, all right, so I found that's kind of a, a useful function for me. So then we have this partially applied one here. And now we could use it with our cap phrase, but we could also use it with, for example, take two, right? To just take two words off of, off of a, a string, right? A, a, a phrase. All right. So, oh, now we were going to switch to um, a, a different set of slides. That so making these Google slides is good because you can like highlight things really nicely. But like lining up all the code so that it looks nice is, gets really tiresome. And so um, I went back to, to some Beamer slides so that we can write. Um, hmm? What are Google slides? Oh, in Google Docs, there's a slide. Oh, OK. You can make slides. And they're, oops. All right. So what we're going to do next is, um, after I gave a talk about contravariance and profunctors, I just barely got into profunctors a little bit in this talk, but somebody sent me this article. So this is, I don't know how many of you know Tom Harding or know of him. Um, he's a really cool guy, and he has written this whole series of posts about the JavaScript fantasy land spec. Um, so explaining functional programming to uh, JavaScripters. And somebody sent me this particular post. No, this isn't the one. Sorry, I thought I had the right one open. You should, of course, read the whole thing, his whole series, because they're all brilliant. But um, what we're looking for is semi-group. So it was actually this post. Yeah. So it was this semi-group post. So it didn't actually have anything to do with profunctors, or at least not apparently. He sent me this semi-group post on Twitter. <coughs> And someone who had heard my talk and asked me, is this hmm? It's all JavaScript, yeah. It's fantastic. It's really hard to read. <laughs> asked me if this merge thing here, right, is sort of captures the idea of a profunctor. So I looked at it, and uh, I said, well, I think so. But like JavaScript is really hard for me to read because I'm not a JavaScripter. So I said, I think so. And then I worked on rewriting it to see if I could rewrite it using a profunctor. And I did, uh, more or less. And that's what we're going to work on uh, That's what we're going to work on next. Do you want to go ahead and start? Well, I was planning that the first part of this would take the whole first hour. And then we would break for lunch. And then I would have my other slides loaded and ready when we came back from lunch. And then we would start writing that example. And now we're like a few minutes before lunch. And it's like I don't have them ready. So I mean, I have the slides written. I just don't have them open. OK, but if you guys are ready to go ahead and get started, are you, are you ready? For lunch? For lunch? OK, fair enough. And I didn't actually check these, so I guess I don't know for sure that they're all uh, good. But how do I get to view, right, presentation? OK. All right, so this is going to be more profunctor. So this is the blog post that we're going to be looking at, and we're going to rewrite this um, from his JavaScript into uh, Haskell using a profunctor. And then at the end of the talk, we will talk more about why you should even care about this. Why profunctors, yeah. So, <clears throat> okay, so if you guys want to go ahead and break for lunch, I can keep talking. We can go right into this, or we can break for lunch. 
Keep talking. You guys are ready. All right. So, okay. I think I'm going to have to. I don't know that it all fit on my slide. I should have see I should have checked this beforehand. All right, so we're just going to look at it in Yeah, it's lots of JavaScript. And so it just doesn't all fit on the slide. Maybe just put in a separate file and enable JavaScript so it's right. Yeah. I can do that. Oh. Oh dear. Maybe. Okay. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. What? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. How to do it? I don't know how to do it. Maybe All right. Just stop and yeah. scroll down and click, sh the sh click shift when at the end of the. the yeah, scroll down. <laughs> scroll down? Yeah, to the end. Okay. Click shift. And click the here now, <laughs> holding shift. It should work. Do what now? Hold shift. Shift click. Hold okay. Shift and click. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then let's. Yeah. Can we? And in the right. Oh, we're still in presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to. No, not JSON. <laughs> I was curious why Sublime Text put JavaScript and JSON in one drop down menu. Confusing. Well, because it's. Is about JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. Can I get out of presentation mode? I don't know how to get out of presentation mode, but okay. It's time? Okay. Okay. Well, so, so this is the JavaScript, right? And this is using the Fantasyland um, stuff. And so I think um, that Daggy refers to something from the Fantasyland. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we have a type, right? That's our customer that has four, four, four fields, right? A name, favorite things, registration date, and has made purchase, which is a bool. Then um, we're going to talk about the my strategy thing a little bit more. And because that was his post, right? His post was about semi-groups, so it was mostly about this, what's going on with my strategy. And then we have this merge thing here that we will rewrite with profunctors. Well, we're going to rewrite the whole thing in Haskell, but but I guess it's time for lunch. Oh, wait, are we, are we ready? OK. All right, so we left off um, talking about Tom's uh, blog post about um, semi-groups in, in JavaScript and in the fantasy land spec, which, again, <coughs> um, it is linked here in case you do want to read that. Um, it, I do, I'll show it again on the slide, but um, I do recommend reading it if you want to understand semi-groups better because it's a really good blog post. His whole series about this, about the Fantasyland spec is really, really good and explains a lot of um, functional programming concepts but uses JavaScript for all the examples. So. Um, <coughs> All right, so we were looking at um, the JavaScript example that he gives. Now, his blog post is about semi-groups, right? And so he has, um, and so he's talking a lot about semi-groups. And so he has this customer type, right? This customer record here. And we've got one field is a string. One of them is a list of strings. One of them is an int, right? The registration date. And one of them is a bool. So as he explains here, 
right? He he says that we're going to turn that we're going to write this two function here. That's going to turn the four customer fields into a tuple of four things, right? into a four tuple. And so he uses the semigroups first for string. And then a list of strings already has sort of a, we don't have to specify which semigroup to use. It's just going to concatenate them. Then he uses min for int, the min semigroup. And he uses any for bool. So any would be a true if any of them are true, right? If any of the fields that we're merging are true. Uh, first, we'll pick the first string instead of concatenating them. And min would take the minimum of the whatever integer values it's given, right? So those are the semigroups. Like I said, um, we didn't talk a lot about semigroups, but semigroups are just monoids without an identity. <coughs> and so um, we are going to simplify, when we write our example, we're going to simplify our type a little bit to just use list of strings because those we don't, then I don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about picking semigroups for for our, our merging. But in his, since his whole thing is about semi-groups, it made a lot of sense for him to pick, you know, things that had different kinds, of different uh, semi-groups available. Okay, so then he has this two function that's going to take the customer and turn it into a tuple of four things. Then he's got a from function here, right, that just goes back the other way. So we're going to take the four tuple and turn it back into a customer. I don't know what you call them in JavaScript. Do you call them a record? Object. object? Oh, sure. Of course, it's an object. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. <coughs> so in Haskell, I would call this a record because I would probably write this with a record type. Um, so we're going to take that tuple and turn it back into a customer record or object. All right, and then we have this merge function here, right? Merge is going to rely on the semigroups on these M's, right? So the, semi, the M's are what is constrained by the semigroup. And so for, um, like I said, for list of strings, we're just going to be using the default list semigroup, which, is, which will be concatenation. For uh, the other string, we had first. For int, we had min. And for bool, we had any, right? So those are the M's that are, that are um, constrained by the semi-group constraint. So we're gonna ha we have two that goes from A to M. We have M to A with the from. And then we've got this A to A to A. That does what? takes in two things and gives us a thing of the same type back, right? But what things are they? What do we want to pass to our merge function and then get back? Customers, right? So the A to A to A is going to take in two customers and give us back a customer. So it's going to go like we take in two customers, we make, turn them into tuples, we merge the fields based on their, their semi-groups, and then we turn them from tuples back into a customer, and that's our result. Right? OK. He says that this is a, a real thing he had to do when he was working in a, uh, for the NHS, and they would have to merge customer records a lot. OK. So we take two customer records that each have four fields, convert them to four tuples. That's the F of a dimap fgh. All right, that's the two function, two tuple. Then we're going to use a semigroup <coughs> to merge each field of the two tuples. That's the h in our dimap fgh. Then we're going to convert the merge tuple back into a record of four fields. That's the g in our dimap fgh. Right? OK. It's a little bit strange um, compared to like when we were looking at the words example. Right? We were just taking in one string and passing one string back out. Now we're taking in two customers to return one customer, which makes it look a little bit like the equivalence 
example that we looked at. And I'll show you that again soon. All right, so if you want to follow along like this, and I think that you should because you're gonna write, um, you're gonna write a profunctor instance. And, um, <coughs> and if you don't do these things here, then you won't be able to compile it and see if you got it right. <coughs> So at the top of a file, add these two imports. You'll need data.semigroup to get the, uh, you don't have to use that, but if you use the, the diamond mapend operator, then, then you need to import that. And then you'll need to import data.profunctor and then open, um, I assume you can do this with Cabal, but I don't know how. So if you open a stack REPL and give it the argument package profunctors, Oh, sorry, it's profunctors, isn't it? So add an S on the end of that. Package profunctors. Then you'll have a GHCI open that can compile your profunctor instance. Profunctors may, if you've never built it before, it may take a, a, a few minutes to build. It's a fairly heavyweight package, which is one reason that people don't often use the profunctor type class. So why is it heavyweight? Why is it everywhere? Why is it heavyweight? Why is it heavyweight? Um, I don't know why profunctor is. I don't know what all it depends on, but I assume it's depending on things that are that also take a while. I know that's what, like part of the reason lens takes so long to build is it depends on profunctors. And profunctors takes a little while to build, not as long as lens. But I'm not sure what profunctors actually depends on that takes so long. Or maybe it's just all the, all the polymorphism. No, I don't know why profunctors takes a while to build, but sometimes it does. The build usually pauses on tagged and con extensions. Sure. So. Mm. Yeah, so we'll have a file that has some imports at the top and then a REPL that we can be compiling our, our code in. There are other ways you can do this, of course, but this is the sort of quick and easy and, and impermanent way, right? Okay. Oh, I think I can actually use my thing again. Yes. All right. So I decided to simplify this a little bit so that we don't have to talk about semi-groups very much. So we are going to just make a customer record here with just two fields. And, I'm, I, and I decided to have them both just be lists of strings because strings have that just concatenation as just their semi-group. And so we don't have to talk about new type wrappers around... Like, remember when we were talking about the monoid of, of integers, and so we were talking about product and some new type wrappers? We have those. We have lots of them, um, you know, to do things like any bool and get a semi-group that's an any. Um, but I'd rather not spend a lot of time talking about those things. So we're just going to use str some string concatenation. Everybody loves a good string, right? Everybody loves to concatenate strings. So... I've just given these two sort of silly names. We are going to uh, go ahead and derive show. I don't know that we need eek, but just it's not going to cost you anything to derive it. So it seemed like when I was doing something, it complained about not having an eek instance, but I don't know what it would be. Anyhow. <coughs> All right, so if we have our customer type, and you can sort of be letting profunctors, if, it's not, if you're not done getting your REPL open, you can sort of let it just do its thing and we can move on. So we've got our customer type, which sort of corresponds to his, although his was more complicated and needed more semi-groups. And now we need to and from functions. So we're going to need a to function that will take now we, we just have, we're just converting it into a tuple with two fields, right? Um, 
So we'll need to and from functions that go from a customer to a pair. And then the from function should go from a pair back. If you don't know how to write this yourself, the next slide is going to show you how, so that nobody's going to get lost or fall behind here. But um, if you can write it yourself, it's always good practice. Yes, potentially a whole bunch of genders, right? Maybe they changed at some point yes, nice. during their, yeah. Nice. Or maybe one time they were filling out your form and they put a gender and then the next time they said NA or something, right? Like, so. So we're gonna let them have multiple genders and multiple known aliases as well, in case they're up to something. <clears throat> I think Tom's was probably a little more realistic in terms of what you know they actually had for health records, but this will be easier so we don't have to do the semi-groups. If you want to more faithfully reproduce Tom's example, of course, and use the semi-group wrappers for you know, bool and string and stuff, then that would be really cool. All right. Does everybody have a to and a from function compiling? to be something like this. Do these seem like reasonable to and from functions? I always think things like this are going to be a lot harder in Haskell than they ever actually are. I, th I think, oh my god, how do we get this from this type to this type? And then it's just, well, you just do this. That's all there is to it. I don't know. It's kind of like writing instances where I still sort of freak myself out about it. Okay, so we have a to and a from function, and we know that that's two of the arguments that we would need for dimap, right? But now is really sort of the hard part, right? Now we need to write the thing that is going to take in two customer records, use semi-group to combine the fields of the tuple, and then, and then, and then be able to give some input to the from function so that it can give us back a customer record. Right. So what we're going to do, because we want to use profunctors, there are, of course, other ways that you can do this. There always are in Haskell. But we want to use profunctors because that's what we're here to learn how to do. So we are going to write a type, a new type, called combiner. Oops, I've just lost something. We're going to write a new type called combiner that will be that will be a profunctor. Now, so the first time I wrote this, I thought, um, or tried to write it, because this was this it failed the first time. Um, I thought, well, what I'm doing is I'm appending, and that's a sort of a to a to a, right? But then combiner would only have one argument, and so then what's wrong with that? Well, profunctors have to have two. 
right? So I can't get a pro functor instance for something that only has one type argument. So now it has two. So two inputs and a result. All right, so the next thing that we need to do then is write a pro functor instance. Okay, so our combiner type is a wrapper around um, this A to A to B function. So we've called that C here. All right, the F is going to be to, the G will be from later on. We don't need to worry about that right now. For right now, we're just going to call them F and G. All right. I couldn't remember what the next slide is because I don't have any way to see notes or whatever. I always need, I really need two laptops so I can remember what the heck I'm doing before the slide comes up. <laughs> All right, in case this might help as you're thinking about it, if you remember the equivalence, because equivalence is similar in some ways to our combiner type, right, where it takes in two A's and returns a B. Now, this one's only contravariant and not pro functor, in part because it doesn't have that, well, really because it doesn't have that second type argument. So, um, but notice what we had to do to apply the one function to two arguments. We're going to have to do that again for our profunctor instance. Right, because our combiner has two, isn't, that C is an A to A to B function, just like equivalence was an A to A to bool. So we have to apply something to each of those, to each of those A's.
All right. Who's who's ready to move on and who wants another minute or two to, to try? Okay. Another minute or two. Did you get it? Hi. All right, are we ready to, to move on? So <clears throat> we should have an instance that looks something like this, right? The f function is two, right? Which is going to take x and y are going, that were, um, that we're passing in as arguments here are going to be two, what? Customer records, right? So X and Y are two customer records. We apply the F to each of them, just like when we were doing the first tuple thing, right? We had to apply first to each of the tuples before we could compare those elements for equivalence, right? So here we have to um, first convert those two uh, customer records to tuples, so that then we can use our C function, which is going to be the one that mappends the fields. And then we'll apply G to the, the, the one tuple that we're returning, the mappended tuple, which will then um, give us another customer. Any questions about this? Um. Oh, okay, sure, fair. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I got all the typos out of my slides. I'm gonna have to remember to. There. How about how if we look at it here, in the code where it came from? There we go. That since that highlighting thing is bad, but there we go. How about if we look at, <laughs> look at it here? There is the combiner, right? Other than that, it looks the same, right? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you for pointing it out. Huh? Yeah, it wouldn't compile without the combiner on there. This does. Not for me. Not for me. It doesn't compile for you? Unless you get what? It does. It does for me. Hang on. I. I'm pretty sure it did. But now you. Now you have me worried. I did. Yeah, mine compiles. So, what do we have? What's what's the <laughs> error telling you? I'm not those. I'm hmm? not those <laughs> yeah, I have the same. That. Did you put? No, yeah, right. That was the typo on my slide, is that combiner has to be wrapping this function, the word combiner, the, the, the constructor. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Or right there. Yeah, because, yeah, I did the same thing apparently when I transferred it onto my slides. I left off this and then had only this, and then, yeah, we're returning a function instead of a. <clears throat> All right, any more questions? Okay, so then, all right, <clears throat> so we're going to use mapend, the mapend for lists, right? So we're, we do need a semi-group constraint on our A values in our combiner. One thing that you'll notice here is that the combiner now doesn't have an A, B, right? It has an A, A, because mapend is A to A to A. Right, mapend can only take two values of a type and return a value of the same type, it's closed. So here we'll call combiner AA. A. We have a semi-group constraint on the A, which means that those A's need to already have some binary associative operation, right? Some implementation of mapend from the semi-group class. Okay, so now we have a function that goes to, like, to a, a tuple and a function here that will rely on the elements inside the tuple having um, semi-groups, so being able to be mapended, which lists of strings do. And then we have a function that goes the other way, that takes them from a tuple back to a customer record. So now all we have to do Let's compose those. So we'll have our to function is our f, like I said. Our from function is our g. And then semi-group combiner, which is, you know, sort of a very fancy mapend, is the h. And we know, we remember from talking about dimap so much that the F and G and H will get applied, the F will be applied first, right? All right. I think, is somebody else beeping? It's not me, right? Okay. I was gonna say, I don't have my phone, so, okay. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. I just want to make sure, want to make sure I'm not secretly a cyborg and I just something just started beeping. All right, <laughs> does it? <laughs> All right, so now we have a customer combiner, and now we want to work out a merge function, like he had, that will take <coughs> two customer records and give us a customer record. So your type signature for your merge function should be customer to customer to customer. I can't flip to the next slide because then it's just there. So the I give away all the secrets, right? You already done? No. Oh. All right. So we're going to write a merge function that goes customer to customer to customer takes in two customer records, uses this function, or sure, function, we'll call it function. Then we have to make customer semi-group, right? Mm -hmm. No, we don't need to because it's using the semi-group instance for tuples. Because by the time it gets to 
the um, All right. okay. yeah, by the time it needs the semi-group, it's already tuples which have a semi-group instance. This is one of those times when had we, when we wrote our combiner type, if we had written it with the record syntax and that little helper function inside, it would probably be slightly easier. You're welcome to change yours to do that if you prefer. The important part is we wrote a profunctor instance and we're all very proud of ourselves now, right? <coughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how I did it. Like I said, there are other ways you could implement this. And if you had written your type with the little helper function, that would be easier at this point because we have to do some unwrapping, right? Just like when we had to use get equivalence to go from, you know, equivalence A, well, equivalence bool A, right? Or the bool's in equivalence, but equivalence A to A to A to B function. We have to do the same thing here, right? We need some way to turn this type into a function, right? Does that make sense, what I just said to everybody? Everybody's nodding, so I guess so. Okay. So this is how I did it. There are other ways you could do it. But we have to unwrap it somehow to be able to pass those, the, the, you know, X and Y to it. Um, because new type AA would mean that it only actually has one type parameter. And so then we can't make it a profunctor. It so has we just need to give it like AB. So yes, right. And so. But we're using it as AAA. Yes. Okay. So when we actually, you know, wrote the semi-group combiner part, where we're actually defining it then as like this function is mapend, yeah. then the two arguments are A and A, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, contrived examples are contrived, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. So are there any more questions about what we've done so far? Okay. So we are almost done. 
Um, I, you know, I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure that I had two hours left of content today. And we are, well, I mean, it's an hour and 50 minutes because I have to give a 10 minute break so that everybody can do things before Chris starts talking, right? Um, and, uh, but I thought, okay, well, I have six hours and this is, this is in the beginner track. So I'm going to start from beginner and I have six hours to get through like pro functors, right? And, um, and pro functors are considered to be fairly advanced Haskell, right? And I know when I started learning about them, I started learning about them just because I s kept seeing people talk about them. They're important, um, like len the lens package, which you may have heard of. Um, the lens package depends on pro functors, and pro functors are an important part of that. And I saw people talking about Opali, which I meant to, to get to, but um, Opali is a SQL generating library that uses pro functors to take in some Haskell, turn it into Squirrel, do, sorry, I call it Squirrel, turn it into SQL, <laughs> and it's become such a habit, apparently, I just, there it went. Okay, so turn it into some SQL and do some things to it, and then turn whatever comes, you know, say, back from the database or whatever, turn that back into a structured Haskell type, right? So Opali uses pro functors to do that, and it's really cool the way it uses it, and I'm, wish we had gotten more time to, to talk about it. When, my, when Michal first asked me to, to talk here, I was supposed to have like 10 hours, and I thought, all right, we can surely get through Opali, but uh, then it was only six, and then, you know. And even when I was just at Zuri Hack, people said, you're doing a beginner class on profunctors, and everybody's laughing, right? Like, this is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> But you know, when I started learning about pro functors, I did it, like I said, because everybody kept talking about them. It's sort of the Haskell, what, what, um, what we call the Haskell pyramid effect, where what it actually takes to be a nor working normal Haskell programmer is like this very l low base. If you understand Monad, I mean, you can, you can do it. But what people talk about, like on Reddit and in blog posts and on Twitter and stuff, and all the, the Haskellers I follow, in on social media and stuff what they talk about is like this upper part of the pyramid up here that like a lot of people don't actually use in day-to-day -day haskell but they're talking about it so i want to know of course right i don't want to be the one person who doesn't understand pro functors so i started looking into them and when i found out that it's really just function composition it's function composition in a slightly weird order but that's really all it is I was just so impressed by this new knowledge that I felt like, yeah, this needs to be a beginner talk because beginners need to know, or some of you are not really beginners, but if you're relatively new to Haskell, you need to know that this thing that people are talking about, these pro functors, these are really understandable in terms of stuff that you already know, like function composition. There's not a lot more magic going on. And I find that to be true over and over again with Haskell. There's not a lot more magic beyond function composition, function application. That's kind of all there is. <laughs> and I really like that about it. So people, several people have asked me, why do we need to know about pro functors? What will we ever do with this? I mean, probably you, will, you could be working Haskell programmers and never write another pro functor instance. And that would be fine. You might start using lenses at some point because they're really useful for some things and they do depend on pro functors. Or you might find that you like using Opali, in which case understanding the pro functors there will help. But, or you might start using some of the streaming libraries like pipes and conduits and understanding the intuition for pro functors where we take some stuff in, we do some stuff and we kick it back out. That can also be useful for understanding streaming. So all I really wanted to convince you in the six hours that we've had together is that pro functors are maybe useful, maybe more conceptually useful than actually useful in terms of like, you know, using, depending on the pro functors package and using the type class, but sort of conceptually useful. And um, I also mentioned Gabe's FoldL library, which is really efficient left folding, and it's a really cool library. However, it also uses existential quantification that I didn't want to have to explain here today. So, um, so there are some really cool pro functors out there, and certainly I would encourage you to explore them. But what I really wanted to convince you of is not that you need them, but that if you do ever need them, 
They're just function composition, and you totally can do it. And I'm done. Five minutes, five minutes early. <laughs>